All right, so uh, inflammation. We had a couple of lectures by Dr. Bradrick on inflammation, and I'm pretty sure you have an idea of what are the details of inflammation. There's an acute inflammation and a chronic inflammation. And uh, most of the times when we talk of tissue injury, we basically talk of inflammation first. And then inflammation leads to tissue damage and so on and so forth. So in this lecture, I'll concentrate on uh, inflammation in relation to immune cells. We've been talking about innate immunity, we're talking about acquired adaptive immunity, we'll continue with that. Uh, and uh, the hallmark of inflammation basically is exactly the same. We'll have redness, we'll have pain, we will have swelling, we'll have uh, loss of function, and we will have heat. So these are some of the things, but the question you have to ask yourself, uh, firstly, why do we need to know that? Remember, uh, if it's a localized inflammation in terms of a boil, of course, patient will come to you and you have to treat it. So you look at a boil, depending upon where that boil is located, and you will see Many a times, if it's an acute inflammation, that will bring patient to you. He will complain of something which is noticeable, something which is red, hot, burning, and it could be localized. So it could be a local uh, inflammatory response. So you see a boil. Or you may see a boil or bunch of boils, and you also may see a systemic response as well. So you may see a person coming uh, with a infection with fever. So remember that if that happens over a limited period of time, good, we will call it as an acute infection, but it can occur over time as a chronic infection. Now, when I initially talked about innate immune response, and I also mentioned that uh, body is not going to wait for an immune response to be acquired because once we say acquired it will take time and sometimes you have to act spontaneously instantly something wants to enter into your body in terms of a foreign material in terms of a non-self may it be a bacteria virus or anything so body has to respond one of the response that body normally has as a inbuilt system is, of course, fever. But that doesn't mean that fever can only occur in acute response. Fever can occur in chronic response as well. And uh, I don't know whether we covered that in physiology, but I'm pretty sure that it would be taught in this DAST courses. What is fever and uh, how do we deal with it? That's why one of the commonest things selling in the market is uh, you know, anti-pyretic drugs. So you will see Tylenol, Advil, and so on and so forth. Very commonly prescribed drug. So as a pharmacist or physicians, we need to know where is this fever coming. So we need to find out the cause of fever. Because if you, if a person comes with fever and you give Tylenol or antipyretic medicine, so that will just take care of the symptom. It would not take care of the cause of the fever. So we have to establish the cause of the fever. And again, uh, remember that there are many causes. I'll talk about that. One of the things that we may mention in this course is there are endotoxins coming from bacteria, and there are other endogenous pyrogens within our body. So whenever our body, for example, you see that some, you have that kind, kind of an aura, you know, I'm feeling sick, I'm about to fall sick. That kind of an aura, a feeling, I think I'm getting infected. That comes when a microorganism tries to enter into your system and your immune system is fighting it back. So that kind of a struggle leads to that feeling that something is coming up. I think I'm, I, I'm feeling sick. 
So that initial feeling of getting sick before you actually become sick is where there's a fight going on within your system. And body has many ways to deal with that. And we are fully equipped with many active substances that we carry in our body. We have degradative enzyme, we have toxic free radical, we have acute phase protein, quite a lot of them. We have a complement system. But again, remember, a good immune response is something that is orchestrated. It's just like an orchestra, you see like 20 people playing violin, but they have to play the same tone. Drummers and so and so, it has to be mel melodious. It has to be in synchrony. That's the whole idea. And uh, I mean, we may see the final presentation of orchestra, but uh, believe you me that they spend a lot of time in practicing. And there will be some kind of uh, problems to begin with when one of them goes uh, away from the crowd. But anyway, so these are some of the things that are already there in our system. Now, coming back to uh, one important concept, I just want to emphasize over and over again so that we have a pretty much good idea. It just like, I mean, I would give you an example or an analogy, not a good an analogy, though I don't want to give it, but maybe it would serve the purpose. It's like you have a uh, Department of Homeland Security. So there's a department over there and it is a homeland security and the job description of that department is protect the homeland. Exactly the same way there's a department of homeland security which is your immune system. And the precise job of that is to protect you being a homeland. So when I say homeland security, of course it's not a very small uh, department. One of the departments will be, let's say, immigration. One of the departments will be, they will have uh, people at the check posts. For example, they want to find out who is going to enter this homeland. And we want to regulate that. We want to know. We want to keep a data. So they'll make sure that all their borders are secured. Right? And they'll make sure either there is a physical person over there or their cameras are there has to be a mechanism whereby they would not let uh, people illegally coming into this part of the world. And you know, having said that, it means that they will try their best, but there always are problems and there always are something going on and so and so forth. Okay, exactly the same way. You have to keep in mind that if they become too lenient, there's another problem. But if they become too strict, let's say they decide that we're going to become very strict. We're not going to let anybody in. Then there will be a problem from trade. There will be a problem from, you know, uh, airport industry. There will be a problem for uh, holiday industry, vacation, and so on and so forth. People in Florida will cry out because the maximum money they get is from people who are traveling, tourists. So things have to be done in balance. That exactly happens in our body. Exactly the same way. It's pretty much the same principle. One of the things that I want to spend some time is that again, let me put it this way. Um, Department of Homeland Security decides that uh, we want to regulate whosoever wants to enter into this country, and that's pretty much not only for this part, for all over the world as well. And uh, I don't know any one of you is that old, and me either, that before 1970, uh, some of the countries did not even have a passport. The passport thing that you take, in, take for granted, that I have to have a passport to travel, was not there. It was non-existent before 1970 in some of the countries. <laughs> Isn't the point? But things are coming up to such an extent that even in this country, if you were to make a passport five years ago, there was a passport without the barcode. But now if you're going to go for a passport, there will be a barcode. 
So exactly the same way. Well, they figured it out now, and it's so amazing that the nature had it already, already there. We didn't know about that, okay? So one such thing is called pattern recognition receptors. So what happened is that a, let me give you an example, anything which is foreign, like a foreigner wants to enter the country, so he or she has to have a passport. But do you think that if he or she has a passport, that is enough for them to enter this country? No. What else do you need? Visa. visa. There you go. You need visa. So there's a processing. So when you apply for a visa, there is a processing of visa. There is a, a biometrics. There is something that they want to know. And as of now, mostly, most of the countries, or let me go back like 20 years ago, they would just ask you to send them your picture ID. So a frontal picture of you, they, that's what they would need to identify. So this means identification purposes uh, was sufficient 20 years ago that all you need to do was to give them your picture of face and ID. So keep that ID as something in immunology we call epitope. Epitope. So immune system wants to see your picture, your face. But now as the things are coming up, do you think that's the only ID they need? No. There's a whole biometrics. They want to know your height. They want to know your weight. They want to know your eye color. And of course, without contact lenses. You want know, to give them your eye color with the contact lenses. So uh, they want to have your fingerprints. So epitope is something that you give your picture ID. And all other things like your uh, fingerprints that you give, immune system also wants to have a fingerprint, but that's a genetic fingerprint. Exactly immune system wants to know that. Okay. And then again, whosoever would have entered, I would say like whenever we had the better uh, ways of recording data, so everything goes into the data. The moment you swipe that car, it shows that you have entered. Exactly that happens in the immune system. So what you need to understand is the babies in the womb of mother, they don't see anything. Not physically you know, like physically, but their immune system would only see their own self. So there is an education going on in their immune system by their immune cells in nine months, nine months, I would say diploma, a degree, that your B and C T cells, which will later protect you uh, in the rest of your life are trained. Just like a policeman, you want to give him a weapon, but you want to train him first before you give him a weapon and let him go to patrol the streets. It has to be, if it comes an authority to deport, for example, an authority to kill or respond, it has to be a training, it has to be regulated, it has to be licensed. Exactly that happens in the immune system and we are learning it, okay? Now, one example, uh, again, is that there is a pattern recognition receptors. And it's so surprising, it's not that something we are coming up, now we just found out now. That's why immunology basically is still learning. This is the mostly highly developed science and no uh, research has been published in any other medical field than immunology. So it keeps on changing. Right? So we are learning how our body deals with it. The whole idea is that, for example, you say, for infection, we give antibiotics. Guess what? Our own immune cells were producing antibiotics already in our system. And they were very smart about that. They knew how much antibiotic to be given, where and when how to regulate, and so on and so forth. So that's interesting part that we are learning from our own immune system. 
So having said that, each and everything, uh, it's just like a departmental store, a big departmental store, they have like 20,000, 50,000 items. They wanna make sure that each one of them has a computer label on there. Right? Even if you wanna go for a very small piece of equipment, it has to have a ID. So that happens is naturally as well. And uh, let me give you another interesting point for those of you uh, who are interested in research in immunology, and I'll make this as a official announcement to the whole class. If anyone of you is interested in this part of immunology, please come and see me because uh, that's where my interest lies. And I'm going to pick up a couple of you uh, for summer internships as well, okay? Now, like human beings, we are living, we have immune system. Plants have an immune system as well. So plants fight microbes. They have innate immunity. They have acquired immunity. So you can imagine that things are something that we are discovering. But anyway, uh, one such thing, and let me go to the next slide because that will better explain what's written over here. So you can read on your book and pay attention to the figure and that will give you a better idea as to what I'm going to talk about. Now you can see that example, if you pay attention to A over here, as I said earlier, that any, anything that wants to try to enter into our body has to have a passport, has to have permission, has to be regulated, and has to have a pattern there, right? So, I'll just pick up, for example, in this slide, three important or four important things that when they enter, uh, they cause problems, right? For example, the problem, and re remind you, let me remind you that if you go in clinical practice in pharmacy and medicine, uh, you will see people have problems with heart diseases, lung diseases, so and so, asthma, and then you want to look at the statistic, which one is the notorious number one killer. So the number one killer across any type of disease is infection. So you can imagine that most of our challenge, challenge is coming from microbes. That's why it gives you significance of knowing microbes because that's what your future career is, okay? Now, in this example, you see gram-negative bacteria. Of, of, of all the bacteria, one of the notorious bacteria are gram-negative bacteria. Then we have gram-positive bacteria. Then we have mycobacteria that causes TB and leprosy. Then we have fungi, like yeast. Then we have viruses. They have nucleic acids. So all these things, common example, want to enter our body. Now our body, basically, this is our body, we have a cell, right? So just like all of them are, want to board a plane, they want to come on Chicago, deep plane, and then there are all those immigration slots over there, there are people over there, there are machines over there, so and so forth. And then they look at the structure of this bacteria. So bacteria, of course, have a physical structure, we discussed that in detail. So they have an ID, they look at that, and then they have very specific, this idea is, this is a very specific thing, if you've come to Chicago, I recently came from, from a trip, and uh, they say, US citizen, carrying green card, all other nationalities, they want to kind of, you know, divide you through different uh, routes. So once your cells over there, which are sitting on those ports of entry, like airports or bridges or seaports and so on and so forth. So they carry very specific kind of tools, very specific kind of tools. And we need to know that. And you may wonder how, Maybe you are a little bit unfortunate or fortunate that we are discovering them day by day. We, 
And the reason is because we want to stop that happening. We don't want this bacteria to enter over here, right? So we have these specific uh, screeners. They are called tall like receptors. They are receptors, they are like little kiosks over there that you go over there for immigration and you give something and they're gonna screen that. So these are called tall like receptors. It's just like 294, 290, not 290, 294, where you have these uh, transponders. So they are they're applied over there and you have that signal, it picks it up and it records that. If you miss that, you know the whole story, it's gonna photograph you as well. So they are specific one. And you can see when we started discovering them, we gave them a name. When we discovered the first one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so and so forth. So for this course, I would just want you to remember nine, not more than that. But eventually when we go further, why do I want you to remember nine? Because if I talk of one drug, so I want to know, you should know that uh, which tall like receptor is going to be affected by that. So these are, and these tall like receptors basically are transmembrane proteins, as you can see from here, they are transmembrane proteins. A part of that lipid bilayer, it actually is intracellular, and part of that is like a signal, an antennae hanging out. It's gonna pick up the signal. So they are out there signaling, picking up, if there is a, and you wonder why do we need to know that? Well, remember, in next slides I'll discuss that in detail. As in this country, you can come by air, you can come by sea, you can come by, by road. And likewise, uh, bacteria also may come in air. So there has to be some kind of antony, some kind of receptor, they will sense it, they will sense it. So bacteria, luckily carry that kind of a pattern, uh, that's what I said, a pattern recognition of receptors. They carry a, there's a pattern on the bacteria whereby your immune system sees it and want to deploy a specific immigration officer, a specific person to take control of that. And remember, part of our job is to stop infection. We don't want uh, these microbes to enter in our body. But at the same time, microbes are pretty smart as well. They, they, they know, and a part of that will be discussed in microbiology, what are their ways of entering? Because most of the time, I'm, I just told you that the biggest killer is infection, so they probably succeed in doing it, and we have a problem. So you can see from here, uh, Gram negative are going to go for TLR4 and 5. Gram positive, mycobacteria are going to go for 1, 2, 6. And viral and nucleic acid are going to take 3, 7, 8, 9. So they pretty much are signal. I gave you an example. You have US citizen, green card, all other nationality, at least three to begin with. So they are kind of channeled over there, right? So this is one mechanism. The other mechanism is that bacteria, when they come, they have some kind of microbial polysaccharides. So they come, so there are some other things that will come and tag onto that. You wanna make sure that they are brought to, to those uh, officers or policemen or so and so forth. So there are many different mechanisms. There are more than one mechanism where body is going to, the reason is, this can only happen if bacteria decide to, to take United Airlines and come and land in O'Hare, so of course they will meet migration officer. But if bacteria decides to go and come across the uh, Arizona-Mexico border, where there is none, or want to find out some other means of entering, we don't have immigration officers sitting here, but we have some other tools, right? So in other tools, we may have something called mannose binding lectin. So they have tool, but he's smart. It's gonna go and attach to that and bring them to justice or bring them to whatever needs to be done. So far so good? 
Okay. Now, having said that, I'm just kind of creating that picture. Now, we've been teaching you physiology, different system for a different function. Now, when I say immunity, I talk of lymphatic system. And so far, I've told you in intrauterine life, there is something called thymus, which is considered as a primary lymphatic organ that produces B and T cells. And after birth, most of the time, thymus gets dried up, involutes. And then bone marrow will kick in to start making those B and T cells because we have to have. It's just like you will say, okay, what's the point? There's no sense of achievement for homeland security that we have secured the borders. We don't need any immigration officer. Or just like your city decided, Chicago's uh, metropolitan decided everything is cool in this. We are very civilized and very, you know, advanced and so on and so forth. So we don't need a police department. Is it a good idea? No. There will always be something going on. It's all human. It's all natural. So body is prepared for that. It keep on making those BNT cells. So all these cells that basically take over they are all scattered. So like immigration officer, they kind of port of entry, but police department, so if the city is a police department, they will house their policemen over there. Some of them will be over there. Some of them, they will be patrolling on the streets and they have their own design uh, duties. Exactly that happens because the part of the job of immune system is surveillance. They want to, to uh, beat the roads and streets. They want to go there and help you. You know, for example, you drive downtown and you find that everything is okay. It's beautiful lake over there. But if you go in the police department, they will tell you what's happening in the same city at the same time when you were enjoying the beach. So likewise, many things are happening in our body. So there are secondary lymphoid organs like lymph nodes. So they are scattered all over our body. They are like police, sta police stations. So they are there always monitoring. You know, for example, the classical example is that since we use our mouth for eating and uh, two functions for eating and for uh, inhalation as well. So we have these tonsils over there. So tonsils are basically lymphoid organs which are there for surveillance. They have a camera there. And they have the sensors there. And they are watching out, making sure. Then we have spleen, because everything needs to be filtered through spleen. So all your blood, every second is passing through spleen. Every second. So we have these policemen, immune cells sitting over there, make sure there is none other than yourself there. Okay, and then there are a bunch of other things that I'll discuss. Pyres patches in intestine. We have mucosa associated lymph node. We have uh, gut associated lymph node. We have uh, bronchi associated lymph node. So there's a lot of lymph node. And I think if you look at this picture, it will maybe give you a better idea of the whole immune system. So you can see we had thymus as a primary organ. And uh, again, I gave you an example. And then for blood vessel, you can obviously see the blood vessels, correct? If you look at your arm, in the summer they are just, you'll see your veins there. But lymphatics, they are there, but you don't see them. There are plenty of them. And these cells of immune system, B and T cells, I'm giving you an example as a prototype, they are continuously watching over there. And sometimes when your hand swells, so you wonder where is this fluid coming from? Edema. The commonest cause of edema is basically lymphatic fluid. So there is a fluid running in these very specific pathways in lymph nodes. 
And many a time you must have heard, I think must have been told in pathophysiology, uh, sometimes people will come that I've got a axillary lymph nodes and they are swollen and painful. So when axillary lymph nodes are inguinal lymph nodes, well, let me give you an example, axillary, because that's a better one. So you look at the axillary lymph node, a young 25-year girl comes and she says that I've got axillary lymph nodes swollen and you examine. So when you examine her left axillary lymph node as a physician, what else do you think you need to examine other than her armpits to look for the swollen lymph nodes? Her breast. The reason is that each and every part of her body has a drainage, lymphatic drainage. They are lymphatic drainage area. So we know, based upon our knowledge of physiology and anatomy, each and every part of your body is drained. So what has happened, what may have happened in this case is that she may have something going on with her left breast, infection, cancer, or any other thing that is causing a response in terms of overproduction of these lymphatic cells. And then lymphatic cells are produced in those lymph nodes. So there's a message over there that something is going wrong in the breast tissue, we need to have more lymph nodes. So in order for lymph nodes to produce more lymph nodes, they swell up. Does that make sense? Anyway, and that happens for every organ. I gave you an example for breast tissue. Uh, I'll take questions at the end, please. Okay. So, uh, so you can see from here, lymph nodes. And the other important thing that you have to keep in mind is there is a continuous circle. Remember when we talk of cardiovascular system, we said it's all closed. But we should have said at that time that it is closed, but it actually talks to lymphatic system. So all the lymph in the body coming from each and every organ of your body Skin, that includes skin as well, breast, you name it. You can see lymphatics all coming over there. And they basically drain into a structure that can visibly, you can see that. This is called thoracic duct. So thoracic duct, and what is the other significance of thoracic duct? Can somebody tell me? So that's one extra credit point if you're going to tell me. What is the significant of thoracic duct? And it has to be quick before Googlers get on. <laughs> Raise your hand. Yeah. No. Quick. Before the Googlers come, please. Yeah. <laughs> the significance of thoracic duct. Yeah. OK. No. The, th the, the significance of thoracic duct is that thoracic duct picks up lymphatics and your fat is absorbed in lymphatics. So fat actually goes from the uh, lymphatic ducts in villi of intestine and they are drained into lymphatic duct and then lymphatic duct goes all the way and drains into right subclavian way and it goes into right atrium. So there is a continuous circulation going on. Okay, the other important thing is that, the other important thing is that you need to know that once an antigen, and basically thoracic duct will drain both sides of the body. It's not only right or left side of the body. This will drain all everything over there. Uh, the other important thing is that now the question comes, and the other name, let me we'll give you another name for this system other than lymphatic system is reticuloendothelial system, RES. There's another term that we'll use called reticuloendothelial system. Okay. A little bit of uh, detail. You don't need to know that much of anatomy. This is a thymus, and you can see thymus has a structure. It is producing those cells, right? Because we don't teach histology as a part of pharmacy 
medical students have to take care of that because we don't go for histology, but all you need to know is that these mean cells produced in thymus in this case. Okay, the other important thing is, uh, we already discussed, that uh, spleen is there to filter the blood. So all your blood goes through the filter, and you can see from here, these are uh, the terminal artery, uh, terminal veins, and then the terminal arteries, and then there is a tissue over there that serves as a sheath. That's where immune cells, B and T cells, are sitting. So whatever comes over there, they are screening it. They have those sensors, and they will see if everything is okay, if, if there's any concern. The other important thing that I'm going to spend a little bit of more time is like police stations, as I had lymph nodes. That's where we keep those cops, B and T cells. So they are routinely produced. They are always there. And as I said earlier, uh, we are so tightly regulated that one specific lymphocyte will go and enter our entire circulation within 72 hours and want to make sure that everything is there in place. There is no foreign material. There is none, non-self. Now, if you look at the anatomy over here, lymph nodes, one thing you have to understand is that uh, it has a cortex. You can see a cortex. And then it has medulla in the center. And then it has uh, these areas which are called lymphoid follicles. So lymphoid follicles have a center called germinal center where these B and T cells are produced. So they are B and T cells produced over there and they keep the record for each and everything. So anything that goes over there has to be screened. And then again, once lymphatics are screened through that and there is no concern, everything is okay, so then they will drain like efferent lymphatic vessel and they will go, as we discussed earlier, through the uh, lymphatic versus a general systemic circulation. And why do we need to know about the anatomy of a lymph node is that once it gets swollen, it can get infected. And sometimes if, uh, let's say, your uh, cells pick up a, a culprit, like a bacteria, so they will bring that bacteria from the periphery and house it into the lymph node, want to make sure then they do a real biometrics on that bacterial viruses. And want to make sure, at the same time, they will also keep a record on that. So that exactly is going on in our uh, lymph node. One other term that I did present earlier, I'll present again, is that anything that wants to enter our body is called antigen, right? Anything foreign. Now, if you have a foreigner and he wants to come in and he has to have an ID and visa, that's what we agreed upon, it has to be presented to those people who maintain the data. So these are cells. They are specialist officers. So these specialist officers are placed at strategic places like ports of entry. So like Homeland Security, we have port of entry. We also have port of entry. So all this opening on the human body, right? Nose, throat, urethra, vagina, anal canal. These are the normal openings to the human body. So guess what? That's where most of these cells carrying all those data and carrying all this ability to look at your passports and visas to so look at your IDs. And these cells are called antigen presenting cells, APC. And also, and you can see them here as well, these are called antigen presenting cells, very specialized cells. And that actually, those of you who are interested in doing research with me, that's what I work on antigen presenting cells called dendritic cells. Because these cells are, they are like Google. They have enormous K 
capability of processing your antigens. They are marvelous. They are, they are those small, but they have capability to process everything. They're called antigen presenting cells. But also remember, uh, what is the largest organ in our body? Skin. Skin. So where do you want to place these kind of cells into if you were to do the surveillance? The largest part of the body should have that, right? Right. If I tell you, most of the people entering into this country, they go by, come by air. So you want to make sure that those people who have this ability should be placed on the airports. Correct? Make sense? So likewise, skin. That's why when we test an antigen, we do skin testing. Because these cells are there. And what is the second place that you want to place this antigen presenting cell at? Other than skin. Say it again. Very good. Mucous membrane. Correct. Because remember that there are two barriers to our body that will stop our entry into the body. One is skin, other is mucous membrane. So skin is something that you see. We have whole lining of respiratory system with mucosa. We have whole lining of urinary system uh, with mucosa. We have whole lining of genital system with mucosa. We have whole lining of gastrointestinal so we want to place these antigen presenting cells there. So these are the two important places. Good. Uh, we want to place our uh, antigens at. Now the question to you is, what is the uh, fate of an antigen? Let's say an antigen wants to enter in our body. A bacteria wants to enter our body. A virus wants to enter our body. What is it that we need to do? We need to firstly uh, locate and find out all the options that antigens have. So we want to secure our borders, right? If there is a threat that an antigen, a flu antigen, a flu virus is out there, or uh, God forbid, if there is a bacillus anthracis over there, something notorious, it wants to enter, we need to block those sites, but before we block, we need to know what are the possible sites that these antigens are going to get into. So remember, skin are mucus barrier. So this is the barrier we have. We are protected from the environment by our skin and our mucous membrane. These are our barriers. So anything, Anything that wants to enter, even food, even water, even your drugs, anything. And remember, as a rule in physiology, unless and until something passes through your mucous membrane or skin, this is not entered you, per se. That's why if you have something in your gastrointestinal tract, it's out there, but it has not entered you. Right? And I'll discuss an important concept when I talk of reproductive immunology, that why would nature place a, uter uh, a uterus in a human body where the babies are kept within the uterus, but technically they are not within our body. And we'll talk about, you know, all the immune system. Very interesting. And that is, uh, but you can see from here, there are three options. Number one, it enters through blood, correct? It enters through blood, and the blood goes to the heart, there's a blood circulation, and then the blood goes to be screened in spleen, and then spleen will pick up if there is any response that spleen has to make, and then there will be an immune response. So this is another fate of antigen. The other fate of antigen is that something actually comes through your skin. So you got a prick, and uh, you put like a lotion, you put a, a jewelry, something that touches your skin, right? So an antigen inserts you. So antigen basically will be there. And this antigen will be screened by the antigen presenting cells. It will sense something. It's going to send a message 
to afferent lymph node, it will go to lymph node. Lymph nodes would need to find out if you really want to do something in terms of immune response. And finally, the other way that antigen theoretically can occur is through your gut. And your gut basically has this capability to sample them. Gut has an enormous ability. That's why the maximum number of immune cells, that's another important thing that I'm going to tell you, central concept is, uh, though skin is the largest organ, but the maximum number and for B and T cell immune cells are present in gut mucosa. That again, uh, those of you who are going to work with me, we do the gut mucosa because one of the most important thing that is coming and it's very important for pharmacists to understand because most of the drugs that you are going to give are oral drugs. And oral drugs, like any drugs, are to be considered by body as an antigen. So your immune system is going to make sure that it looks at it very carefully before it gets absorbed. Okay? Now, that's what I said, discussed, that there are three routes, state of antigen after penetration, reticular endothelial system, and these are the three main routes that we discussed. So these are some of the routes that your body takes allows for them to enter, right? Now the question that you'll ask yourself that how frequent do we, uh, do we see these uh, antigens? Well, you breathe 16, 17 times a minute, you eat, Right? So pretty much your mucosa skin is exposed. So uh, if some antigen comes into that, we have an ability that if your system has not seen that antigen, there are at least at least like 100,000 100, cells out there to welcome you. It's just like you land on the airport and there are 10,000 people to look at your ID. But that's what how prepared our immune system is. So chances are that most of the time these lymphocytes are naive. This means they haven't seen you before. That's what it means. If you are an antigen, you want to come over here, there are lymphocytes over there, they are naive, they haven't seen you. If they have seen you, they will respond differently because they have the data. So the nature has devised a very ingenious mechanism that everything in the body where the antigens can probably come, they drain into lymphatics. It goes to lymphoid organ. And then again, remember that there are cells stationed in lymph nodes. They are there always, all the time, in the skin, in the mucous membrane, and in the lymphatics. But also there are some cells which are on patrol. They are running in your system, in your lymphatics, in the blood. It's pretty smart. And I gave you an example that anything that normally enters your body has to be seen. It cannot be overlooked uh, by antigen, it, though it may take time. Right? It may take time, but nevertheless, it's going to get uh, located. So the final slide, uh, I'm running one lecture behind. So the final slide is that we talked about innate immunity and uh, adaptive immunity, but our immune system doesn't cl classify that. Immune system is one. We classify that for our learning, so that you have this chart in your mind that innate immunity involves physical barrier like skin and mucous membrane, there are chemical barriers, and there are cells. And then acquired immunity have a specific receptor, and they all work with B and T cells. So they are they all a part of the homeland security. May it be immigration, maybe police. There are many things happening, and there is an orchestra. There is a coordinated response, and all these are players. So, so far in the last couple of lectures, what I've tried to give you an overview that this is an immune system, these are the players, this is how they work, and this is what we need to know. So when we built up the story, and we want to regulate that, you will have an idea. And finally, you will wonder, all those drugs, that we are giving to the patient are based upon uh, our understanding of immune system. Because even if you give a drug, it's going to be antigen. If you get infected, it's an antigen. 
You got allergy is an antigen. So if you are playing with the human body, if you're playing with the human body, in medicine, they say if you know immunology, you know medicine because you know whole immune system. And then again, uh, I don't want to overemphasize that, but keep in mind that uh, 60 to 70 percent drugs out there which are going to come in the next 10 are all going to be immunology based. So don't take it just to pass an exam. Don't take it just. I would appreciate that if you can get your minds and heart involved and get to the fundamental understanding of the immune system. It will be easier for you when I go for the clinical immunology part. Okay? All right, thank you. And now, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, I kind of finished on time. <laughs>